All right. I will now switch to English. Austin Fitz. We've had her as a guest before, and I'm glad to see you again. Um, Catherine, are you, can you hear us, see us? Yes, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. And we see a nice uh, okay. um, revolutionary Hi. picture in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's Gideon from the story of Gideon in the Bible. Ah, okay. Painted by a Hungarian who was very revolutionary. <laughs> okay, so that's the okay. okay. Yeah, maybe um, would you maybe like to introduce yourself to like in case people don't know you already, which I guess is only a, a small fraction. But anyway, so uh, first of all, let me just say it's always a privilege to be with you. So thank you very much. And okay. I have to do a sneak announcement, which everyone will know next week, but it's not until the beginning of the week that it gets announced. Wolfgang is going to be Hero of the Week on the Soleil Report next week, uh, in part for all the things he's done, but finally his new book, False Pandemics, which is available in English. So I just have to plug that. It's terrific. So thank you, Wolfgang. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Finally in English. You're very good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very good. I've been, I, I bought a bunch and I've been spreading them around. So it uh, it's has been actualized a little bit. Yes. Yes. Good. Um, so my name is Catherine Austin Fitz. I'm publisher of the Solari Report, and I also have another company that uh, Solari Investment Screens. And I came from Wall Street in Washington, and then got into a big squabble with the Department of Justice in the '90s that made me dig down and learn how the economy really worked. And that's what I've been up to ever since. Um, my our, our our goal at Solari is to help people engineer a for-profit revolution. We're a great believer that what is currently happening with central control is destroying wealth in all its forms, living equity and financial equity. And what we need to do is we need instead to build a civilization that, that not only builds wealth, but allows control to be dispersed and decentralized. So our interest is in freedom and, and all the things we need to, to do to get there. And I think that's what the committee has been discussing since I've known you, is what in the world is going on? And how do we how do we engineer things back headed in the direction of freedom? So that's that's my interests. Anyway, so I'm here today to talk about the Bank of International Settlements. Before I dive in, is there anything you want to say or ask? No, I think I'm I'm very curious to hear what you uh, will tell us about this like creature that's uh, <laughs> to most people not really well known. So the Bank of International Settlements, let me just, I'm going to do a screen share and bring up my PowerPoint. Oh, let me just get this going. Okay. Okay, so the Bank of International Settlements is a bank in, in, in Basel, Switzerland, which has as its members 63 of the largest global central banks. So it's not all the central banks, but it's by far and away the predominant ones, G20, et cetera. Um, they have a very good website, so you can learn a tremendous amount about them if you go to the Bank of International Settlements website. They, um, they were created at the end of World War II, and the ostensible reason was to handle the reparations to, from Germany to the Allies. But if you look at the correspondence around them, uh, in fact, the real reason was for many years, the central banks had wanted to create a bank that enjoyed sovereign immunity. In other words, it can operate above the laws of any national government and it can operate in secrecy. So you're talking about a entity that is above the law and yet it has the power through its members to create many of the laws, you know, that the rest of us are subject to. And so the title that I gave to these slides is the use of sovereign immunities and secrecy to engineer a global coup. Now, before I dive in and tell, tell you more about the BIS, I want to use the expression breakaway civilization because the existence of international institutions with sovereign immunity acting above the law financially and operationally it's far from just the BIS. The BIS is at the head of a global octopus of institutions which are operating behind sovereign immunity. And, and so while they don't have to obey the rules, 
Um, we do. And not only that, they get to create lots of rules for us to obey. And this is one of the fundamental issues that must be addressed if we're going to reverse things and, and come back to a world of freedom. So one group of people can has, is free to be secret. They are free to print money. So the debt growth model um, is the secret sauce behind the BIS and the central banks because they can print money out of thin air and do it in a way that load us down with debt and interest payments. Um, the reality is there's no reason we need central banks. You know, we are perfectly capable of having currencies and operating economies without central banks. And so um, one of the issues faced by the central bankers, if they don't move to total control, how are they going to keep control? Because at some point, everybody's going to realize as the debt continues to explode, oh, you know something, it would be cheaper to operate without you. Now, why are we talking about the BIS and why is the BIS of interest? Um, there is a push uh, for the creation of digital a system of digital IDs and central bank digital currencies. Um, and those uh, central bank digital currencies, along with digital IDs, are going to create a system of complete transaction control that... Um, that will literally be the end of freedom. So uh, if you don't behave, um, you have, you know, they can literally turn off your money. So I want to show you one video from um, an IMF panel in 2020. This is October 2020. This is Augustine Karstens, the general manager of the Bank of International Settlements of the BIS, and what he's going to say is that with CBDCs, um, your deposits are no longer your money. They're their money. They can, can, they can set the rules and they can enforce the rules centrally. This is all in 56 seconds. Here we go. The use of general, to the general use, uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash. Uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who's using a $100 bill today, we don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. A, a, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important, and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, she, to what cash is. Um, okay, and then the, um, the next slide is another video. So maybe if you could, is it Corbin who's bringing him up? Who's, I don't know who's bringing him up. I can play it here. Let me do this. Oh, I can, I see. I think that uh, Corbin was just able. He he looked for the video and was able to then, uh, you know, send it to the the team here. Okay. Well, let me play this one here. I don't know how I can stop you from seeing the other slides. Let me just play this. It's not so important. Like yeah. we can also zoom in. It's so possible is that. Uh, even if you have to have CBDC in some form, that you're not destroying the banking system. If you do it the way China is doing it, now you have to remember China only recently introduced their banking system, and it seems they were not willing to ready to give it up. They have already CBDC. It's still a pilot project, but it's introduced you know, among millions of people already. But it was introduced on purpose in such a way that it would not harm the banking system and therefore is a more um, truthful sort of update of the of the old paper money. Um, but of course, it still has the control aspect. So at least it's not killing the banking system. Uh, the way they do this is by um, requiring you to have a bank account in order to get CBDC. So it's not a direct account at the central bank. It's only through your bank that you can get it. You see how simple that is, and of course could be done over here, but they're not discussing it in, the, in say, the ECB is not discussing it because you see their agenda is to get rid of banks. But this alternative exists. But then, of course, the key problem is this control aspect, 
um, which at the moment they haven't stepped up in China, but that can be introduced any time. And that, of course, is a concern. Also, they never talk about the nature of this CBDC. What, what is it actually going to look like? They never talk about that. Right. Um, but I heard one European central banker tell me what it's going to look like. He saw it. He was invited to one of the old central banks in Europe that are very much promoting this. And they showed him. And, you know, he's he's a top, um, you know, executive director of another central bank in Europe. And there's no reason to believe that he was telling me a story. Um, and it was around this, this large and would be implanted under your skin. So that is the plan. Right. And, of course, that has other implications on top of what we've mentioned on top of the control aspects, because that actually enters your your body, in my view violates uh, violates human dignity, and can be then used for uh, even in terms of functionality beyond the monetary and economic transaction purposes. So highly dangerous and definitely something we have to oppose. And so using cash is one of the things we can do to make sure um, that it will be the hurdle will be higher for the central planners to introduce the CBDC. So that is Richard Warner, who is one of the top academic scholars on banking and central banking in the world. Um, and what he's describing is the integration of the financial transaction system controlled centrally with the same systems that do surveillance and entrainment and subliminal programming and mind control. So you're talking about a full human body system of control that is quite extraordinary and of course solves the problems that uh that the leadership were dealing with when they canceled slavery in other words if you look at the reasons they canceled slavery this technology solves some of those problems um okay so so let me jump back so if you look at where the bis is headed it's certainly a very dire place, and we'll get back to that. Let me go back and, and sort of help you with some of the history. The history of the powers and authorities of the of the BIS started with the Hague Convention. Again, when, I, when they created in 30 and 36, they created a bank to help them ostensibly sort of deal with the reparations coming out of World War I. It was created as a bank with self-perpetuating powers, a self-perpetuating board of directors, it now has 63 uh, central banks and monetary authorities. You can go to their website, and it's all fully disclosed. What is of great concern is a network that is now being put in place called the Innovation Hubs, which are hubs around the world designed to help bring in CBDCs in 190-plus countries. Their powers and activities are to hold and transfer gold, to hold, and this is for their members. So for their members, they hold and transfer gold, bank deposits and multiple currencies, securities, data. Um, they promulgate regulatory standards for their um, members and manage collective investment vehicles as well as services for others, which is not quite clear. But I would note on their balance sheet, they make it clear that they can keep an infinite amount of money in investment pools that are off balance sheet and secret. Now, remember, all of these things can be done for their members in secrecy and uh, immune from the national laws. So you're talking about a money system that can transfer and hold money globally that is both secret and not subject to, to national laws. So if you look at how this was constructed, it's it's evolved over many years, um, some of them described here. And again, much of this you can find on their website. The date I want to focus you on is 1994, when the New York Fed and the Fed purchased shares. And um, it was later, a little bit later, that they then closed out all the private, there used to be private shareholders. Um, when the Fed purchased shares, they, the Fed had always been active but felt it was a conflict of interest to own shares. But there was an integration that occurred in 1994. And one of the reasons that's so important is 
wait a minute, that was the year, it was fiscal 1997 that vast amounts of money started to disappear from the federal government. So the U.S. federal government since fiscal 1997 is missing $21 trillion, or there's $21 trillion in undocumentable adjustments. And that move started to happen not that long after the New York Fed and Fed bought shares in the BIS. And one of my big questions is, was the majority of that money laundered out through the BIS? Um, again, the BIS having sovereign immunity and nobody being able to pierce that veil. Remember, the New York Fed is the depository for the U.S. government. So they, they control and operate the bank accounts. And if they're $21 trillion of undocumented transactions... Those transactions were made through the Fed as agent or their member banks. The, in 1999, a financial stability forum was created that then became a board in 2009 during the financial crisis. Um, and, and that uh, institution, there are serious questions as to whether they have found a way to extend their sovereign immunities um, through those institutions, which we'll talk about in just a second. The innovation hubs began in 2019, and these hubs, which are in Switzerland, Hong Kong, Singapore, London, Stockholm, Frankfurt, Paris, Toronto, and then they have a big New York Innovation Center, all of these, from everything we can tell, enjoy sovereign immunity in negotiation with a treaty with a host company, which gives the ability of the BIS and who's ever working on CBDCs with them in that area sovereign immunity, including on the facilities that they have there. Um, if you look at some of the immunities, they can be quite extraordinary. So um, uh, they, no one is allowed in, their, in the Bank of International Settlements. They have their own, essentially their own police, and the, uh, the Swiss enforcement folks cannot come in without their permission. They have diplomatic immunity from arrest, imprisonment, seizure. The one thing they're not subject to, they are subject to uh, traffic enforcement. That's the one exception. But this means they can carry documents and data, you know, and digital files and digital assets anywhere in the world behind diplomatic immunity. Nobody can touch them. No taxation, no oversight, no regulation, their freedom from immigration restrictions, um, they're free to encrypt and exchange encrypted data above sovereign immunity, the freedom from local legal jurisdiction, and on and on and on. And if you look at those powers, particularly to the extent they've been extended um, through the Financial Stability Board, they are potentially awesome. And, and when we combine them with the other international organizations who've been created um, and enjoy sovereign immunity. You are literally looking at, this is the financial train tracks of building a breakaway civilization, which is what has happened. Um, John Titus made a video that I recommend to all of you called All the Plenary's Men about the criminal prosecution of HSB or the protection of HSBC from criminal prosecution in 2012. And it's this case study that has... Um, indicated to us that we believe the BIS has found a way to try and extend sovereign immunity through the systemically important banks, insurers, and payment systems that um, they run through the Financial Stability Board at the BIS. So the Financial Stability Board has uh, designated systemically important financial institutions, which are mostly banks. You can see them listed over on the right of the slide. They have designated some insurance company as systemically important insurance companies. And then the third group, which is not shown and for which we cannot get any data, is systemically important payment systems, which, of course, are very critical train tracks within the financial system. And so one of our major questions is, are these, are these banks and insurance companies and payment systems in a position to enjoy some or all sovereign immunities. Increasingly, our guess is yes. Of course, we know the innovation hubs, uh, according to their agreements and treaties with the local country, do appear to enjoy that same immunity. And of course, if it's BIS staff working there, they enjoy that immunity anyway. 
So as I said, the power of the BIS is not just in its ability to run a global system which can print money and do anything with it behind sovereign immunity and without taxation, um, and probably, uh, if I'm right, extend it through the fin- systemically important institutions in the uh, in the FSB. It's that they are the financial train tracks that supplement and complement lots of other institutions that enjoy sovereign immunity, including the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and the IMF. If you look at what has been going on around the world, a lot of what's been happening is debt entrapment. And the IMF and the World Bank, in my opinion, have been critical to entrapping countries in debt, lever them up, and and that's all part of the game of getting central control. There is... um, Corey Lynn has been writing and publishing a series on the extraordinary number of institutions in the Americas and in Latin America created by the United States at the end of World War II that all enjoy sovereign immunity. So the number of institutions that enjoy this sovereign immunity are far greater than what we see on this slide. But there is no doubt, as you are clearly aware, that that if you just look at what is being done with the BIS, the United Nations, the the Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Health Organization, it's extraordinary. Now, the thing I want to underscore is when you give an institution the power to avoid all rules, the power to print money out of thin air, which it can through its members, and the power to enjoy secrecy globally, What you're doing is you're creating a model that is destined by the comp, you know, the magic of compound interest to end up owning everything. It's simply a matter of when and how. And so the the challenge we're facing here is the model is antithetical to life and antithetical to freedom. And it's certainly antithetical to all the laws constitutional laws and basic laws of any of the countries that are their members. But what it does is it gives the ability to do what they're doing now, which is basically using their powers to destroy the sovereignty of every nation in the world. Now, if you're the BIS and the bankers, you can do that all with monetary means. You don't need the World Health Organization, but to, to basically do it in a way that the mob doesn't turn on you and get you with pitchforks. Because if you look at the bankers, you know, there are very few number of people. But if everybody figures out this is the bankers and and go after them with pitchforks, they can't do what they're doing. They can't get away with what they're doing because what they're doing is criminal. And, um, And that's where the World Health Organization comes in and using pandemics and biowarfare and poisoning to accomplish their tasks. And I believe that um, if you look at, at their push through the World Health Organization right now, that's the bridge of control they need to get to the point where they can implement CBDCs. CBDCs and digital IDs are going to be very complicated and difficult to implement. And it's, go- it's not something that they can do immediately. So the question is, until they get total control through the financial transactions mechanism, How do you build your train tracks of control? And of course, one is controlling the food supply and another is through the World Health Organization and all the different health bureaucracies like One Health. So if you want more background reading on the on on the BIS, I would I would recommend a series of different books and articles. I would start with the BIS website and a wonderful book called The Tower of Basel by a uh, by Adam Labor that was published in 2015. It's got an excellent review of the history and sort of how the bank grew and evolved. I would recommend, again, John Titus's um, video at his best evidence channel, All the Plenary's Men. Patrick Wood has been warning about this for years, and um, he has an article from 2005 uh, at his website, Technocracy Now, on the BIS, and there, and he focuses very much on the danger of sovereign immunity. I have an article at Solari.com called "Does the BIS um, OS Twenty One Trillion Dollars?" 
And Carolyn Betts wrote an, an excellent book review of the Tower of Basel. If you um, uh, if you want to read that, um, and don't have time to read the book, so uh, very good book review and lots of detail about what's in the book. And then I have an article called "I Want to Stop CBDCs." What can I do? It's got a copy of the different videos and other very powerful videos that describe the dangers of CBDC quite well. So. There's a fair amount of material if you want to uh, get uh, yourself educated. As Corey Lynn at Corey Diggs publishes her, her articles on the organizations with um, sovereign immunity, I would also recommend those. Um, as Richard Warner said, um, it's uh, over on the right. We have every week we publish a cartoon. Right now, we're if you go to Solera, our newest cartoons are on sex and, and CBDCs. <laughs> So we've been on sex for a couple of weeks, but um, the idea being that people who use cash are much more attractive and fashionable. But here we have a woman checking out at the grocery store and uh, the, the cashier says to her, how would you like to pay cash or slavery? <laughs> anyway, so uh, so on the left is a, uh, a cartoon we use on Solari. Um, in fact, at the end of March, we are going to, we just ordered a whole bunch of hats that say, make cash great again. And, and we're going to do another series that say cash every day. But the hope is the more people who not only get start using cash, but start engaging with their local business people and, um, uh, and sort of local merchants, uh, about the importance of using cash, the, uh, you know, the more the conversation can happen about how we start to build economic resilience at a local level and protect our sovereignty. Because as I said, this is not, we we don't, the, the reason you want to stop international organizations from having sovereign immunity and being above the law, and you want to stop a, a financial transaction control grid is that these two things make individual or national sovereignty impossible. And at the end of the day, what this comes down to is, are we going to be sovereign or not? And one of the secret sauces behind the, you know, the case for our team winning is without, you know, the financial system is simply a creature of law. It's contract law and and financial transaction law that creates financial assets. And we've bubbled the economy with fantastic amounts of financial assets. And if there's not going to be any law and the pirates are above the law, then, you know, all financial liquidity is going to break down, um, which means that ultimately our team, you know, the freedom team can create a lot more wealth than the, than the controllers. All they can do is harvest steel and, and control wealth. So at the end of the day, this is really about sovereignty. And um, I think once you take a serious look at the BIS and the institutions that enjoy sovereign immunity and where they're going, they're creating a world that you and I don't want to live in. So, um, you know, it's just another, another picture. And, you know, it's another piece in the jigsaw puzzle of how control is engineered. Um, but I think it's an important one, because if you look at the bureaucracies that run the world, you know, the BIS is very much at the top of the bureaucracies that run the world. Um, and if you add the banks and insurance companies that they've designated as the systemically important, you've basically put together a combination of the most powerful financial institutions in the world who can print money out of thin air and operate above the law. And, and that describes a great deal of the train tracks that the corruption has grown on. So with that, let me end this share and turn it over to you for questions. I have a question. You mentioned that the, <clears throat> that the Fed bought shares at this Bank of International Settlement. How, how does one have to imagine this? Like who do they buy this from? What kind of price uh, might, might, be, might we be looking at? And what's the, what, does the, um, what are you then entitled to do in case you own these shares? So I can't answer the I – don't, I don't know what the terms and conditions of that purchase was – 
The Fed and the New York Fed were very active in the BIS government before they bought shares. So I'm not sure if it made that much difference. But my guess is, and these are this is total conjecture, that by by everyone coming in as shareholders and then excluding the private shareholders, they could basically engage in this extensive kind of money laundering and money movements and together share the profits. And that made it much easier to engineer cooperation among literally 63 central banks. So if you're going to move $21 trillion out of the U.S. and launder and do various things with it around the world, you're talking about a, a massive amount of money. And if you're not one of the shareholders, then the other central banks are getting the profits and you're not. If they're private shareholders, you have to share the profits with them and some of the disclosure. So for complete secrecy and for everybody to, to be able to share the profits in their pro rata percentage, you need the private guys out and everybody in. So I suspect it was because they were going to radically increase the size of the BIS financial operations. Now, when you talk to most people who are trained on Wall Street or in Washington, and you say the BIS, they think of the BIS as a regulator. If you look at what happened after 94 and then 97 when this money started to move, I think of the BIS as the largest money laundering operation in the world. Okay, I have like, um, uh, you know, like um, additional questions. Like these private shareholders, who do we know who they were? Um, I don't know who they were. I know one who was squeezed out and brought... Uh, started to bring a lawsuit. I don't know how far the lawsuit went, but he he sued, you know, negotiating the price. And I have it on my list to talk with him. So I know one of the people who got squeezed out and he may know, but I'm not familiar. But what these were private people or like representatives of companies? Uh, like what you just, is this like a company? And how did they these private shareholders get uh, get in there to begin with? At one at one point, it was a possible, you know, it was an investment open to, I'm assuming it was accredited investors. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know. All I know was that there were still private investors left and they squeezed them out. And I think the reason they squeezed them out is what started in 1997. So it started in October 1997, which is the beginning of the Fed fiscal 1998 year. Mm -hmm. So so I think it, I think they did the manipulation, I think they did the re-engineering because they were planning on engineering a global coup. And you needed the private guys out and you needed to to make sure that, you know, if there were a lot more financial movements and activities that could generate a lot more profit, you needed to make sure everybody had a clear picture of who was going to get what in terms of participating in the profits. And that's That would be one of the reasons that the Fed and the New York Fed went in. Now, if you look at their board structure, it looks to me like the Bank of England and the Fed are two of the most powerful board players governing the BIS. And um, so the money that gets into that bank and is maybe then laundered um, somehow, like where does that money come from? So that comes from the central banks. It's their own money or is it like like laundering opportunities for other players okay. as well. So so remember, what the BIS has the power to move money around globally to hold or move for the central banks, and there could be hundreds of legitimate reasons why the central banks would want to do that. Okay? So we're not talking about those. Um, if you let, Let's go back to the United States with 21 trillion of undocumentable adjustments. Okay, so that started in October 1st, 1997. So in the first year, in the first couple of years, um, by 2001, you had HUD was missing. And I think I think HUD was missing about 200 billion and DOD was missing about three trillion. Okay, so let's just say round figures 
in that first four years, you have $4 trillion of undocumentable adjustments at the federal government, and the federal government is refusing to obey the auditor disclosure laws. Mm -hmm. So that's what we know. So let me just, I'm talking totally theoretical. When in 1994, when the Fed went on to the, onto the BIS, became a BIS shareholder, was the same year that Robert Rubin brought Epstein to the White House. And if you read Whitney Webb's book, Epstein met, you know, went to the White House many, many times before the Clintons left office. The Clinton Foundation was created at the end of 1996, I think, somewhere in there. And when Clinton left office, the first thing he did was got on a plane with Epstein and went and visited countries all over the world. Okay. Now let's just pretend for a second that you can, you can take money out of HUD. You can take $59 billion out of HUD and you can, the New York Fed can move it to the BIS accounts who can then move it to countries all over the world. And you can make a deal with them to take a percent and then donate the rest back to the Gates Foundation or the Clinton Foundation. Why not? Once that money, now what's not legal is for the New York Fed to move the money out of a treasury account into the BIS to do these things and not not disclose it on the books. So, so the accountability point here is why did the New York Fed as depository agree to continue to run the federal accounts when the federal government was clearly breaking the financial disclosure and the financial management laws. And if money was moved illegally out of those accounts, then they are liable. And, but in the meantime, they've taken to being allowed to have these uh, secret, these black, um, black budgets um, really officially. Right. So, that so in fiscal, that right. In, the mm -hmm. problem became in fiscal 2018, Well, they took a series of steps during the 2000. If you go to Solari, if you go to missingmoney.solari.com, you know, all the documentation is there for everything I'm describing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, and it's quite extensive, but they did a series of things culminating in fiscal 2018, October 2018, during the Kavanaugh hearings, the, um, the, Congress, both sides, both House and Senate and the White House, agreed to a policy called Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board Statement 56 that basically said a secret group of people by a secret process could move accounts outside of the publicly disclosed financial statements without disclosure, mm -hmm. which means Now, not only did they take that position for the federal government, but they also took that position for companies that did a lot of business with the federal government. So especially when you add the classification laws. And so what you've got is a situation where the financial disclosure of the U.S. government of 150 agencies of the federal government related entities and commissions as well as a lot of the big defense and other contractors and banks who do business with the federal government is essentially meaningless. There's no way now. And that's before we assumed that the sovereign immunity has been extended to the systemically important banks and insurance companies, because mo many of the big institutions that are the biggest ones doing business with the federal government are those systemically important institutions. So what I'm saying, Vivian, is you're talking about creating a financial powerhouse, which is a breakaway civilization. They're above the law. And so if all that, if, if money gets in there, do we have to as, assume that these people involved, the directors of Allianz or whatever, that they know that it's um, coming from black budgets could could maybe come from black budgets i mean who 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 knows about maybe the background of like has the information that you are suggesting so that's an excellent question what i find is that information is very much um 
you know, everybody's on a need to know basis. And you'd be amazed at how high people can go before they have any picture of the whole thing. And one of the things I did when I left Washington is I made it one of my goals was to create an integrated picture of of the whole economy, both overt and covert. And what I found in the process, for, I, I give you a perfect example. When Hank Pullman, who was the chairman of Goldman Sachs, became secretary of the Treasury, during the financial crisis, he announced that they weren't going to bail out AIG. Now, I could have told Hank Paulson if he'd asked that that was impossible, that they had to bail out AIG because AIG was running so many black accounts that there was no way a bankruptcy of AIG would allow all that documentation to be in play and get out in the marketplace for some of it. And there was no way the feds could afford that leakage. So, so the cost of not bailing out was always going to be greater than the cost of, mm-hmm. of bailing out because the, the secrecy leak leakage would have, you know, it could have imploded the U.S. government and the U.S. financial system. But what shocked me was that Hank Paulson didn't know that. And what I realized was I knew more about the covert operations at the Department of Justice than Hank Paulson as the chairman of Goldman Sachs, which to me was pretty shocking. Well, and if that if that money comes now from maybe these black budgets, do you think it just goes into like, um, so is it, is it like a whatever a lobby con- collusion kind of thing where it goes maybe to uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or do you think it also goes into like really? Uh, I mean, is that a criminal? I mean, like a really criminal, um, you know, like um, maybe false flags, flag operations, or like um, something really like like people trafficking or so. So. Okay, so so think of the economy as like Disney World, and you have the upstairs and you have the downstairs. Mm. And at the end of World War II, we created the conditions of creating this breakaway civilization. And from that point on, we, we created three layers. We created a layer of what I call a hidden system of finance with the money that was seized from the Germans and the Japanese and the other resources seized in the war. So that was one layer. And and one of the things that layer did was proceeded to try and run and control organized crime globally. Mm-hmm. So this operation is deeply integrated in with narcotics trafficking, other forms of trafficking. So, so, so this layer is the predominant leader in organized crime. Okay, so you have the hidden system of finance. And remember, it's the allies. So it's particularly England and the United States. So it's the city in New York running this. Then you have a layer, which is the black budget. And the black budget is money that the Congress has appropriated or the Fed has financed or the primary dealers under the Fed have financed that can be spent secretly. So that's called the black budget. Okay. And then you have a whole layer of money that is spent for national security that is not black budget or hidden, but it is secret. So, and now with FASB. And these three pots have grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And, and you know, because essentially if, if they are above the law and are not necessarily subject to taxation or regulation, they're going to grow much faster. Now, Part of the power of this is if you run a central bank during the financial crisis, you're loaning to the banks at 1% to 0%, and the average American is borrowing money at 17%. Now, this is why if you go through the history of central banking, any time a society makes usury legal, It's only a matter of time until it fails because you have one side of the house harvesting the other side of the house and eventually it collapses. And that's part of what we're looking at because remember this machinery can basically create an infinite amount of money and use that money in a variety of ways. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to grossly oversimplify to make the point. The fed 
you know, basically created three trillion dollars at the beginning of the pandemic. This is part of the going direct reset. At the same time, the pandemic shut down whole sectors of the economy. And what that meant, the people who got that three trillion dollars could buy up the assets of the shutdown economy for cheap. So in terms of disaster, capitalism was fantastically profitable. It worked. And that's what we need to understand. We're talking about a machinery that that the way the model is engineered, whether it's the black budget or the institutions with sovereign immunity, their ability to to gain and control all the assets on the planet is enormous. And the last, you know, the last step is CBDCs and digital IDs, because then they have complete control of everybody 100% of the time. And then we also have to look at like who owns the Fed, because that has been like researched in the meantime, at least. I mean, I, I don't think that we have like really a lot of names, but we know that it's what well, that it's actually there was the FOIA in 2018 mm -hmm. that I had been told by the Fed that the number, the members who own stock and the percentages. Now, there, there's the stock of the individual banks is owned by the members, but they wouldn't disclose what, you know, which members own what percent. So, um, so in 2018, there was a FOIA and they did disclose percentages in the New York Fed. And in fact, we have that up on our website in our SPAC wrap up that we did um, first quarter last year. But so there is some information. What they also won't disclose is what their members access to their data is, because if you, You know, if I had not a penny to my name, but you gave me access to all the data that the New York Fed has, you know, I could be a billionaire in, in relatively short order because it's the ultimate inside information. And so one of the questions I once asked all the public affairs officers at all 12 banks was, what is your policy about sharing your data with your members? Mm -hmm. And they wrote back and said that that policy is confidential. Wow. So prior knowledge of maybe what's going to happen might be also like, I don't know, some trading deals or like uh, activities of, of the, like wh when the, the interest rates are going to go up and so, these kind of things. Well, one of the, one of the fo folks who got in trouble at the Fed was an economist who warned that there was something, there was a problem before 9-11 and he got booted out. Wolfgang, did you have a question? Yes, I, I just imagine that this that money is only something we believe is there. We right. just believe in money. Right. There are there are people writing numbers in books. Right. And 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 you there are people living on the land. Right. There are people working somewhere. And we they believe they believe and we all believe in this money. And we believe that if you give a piece of a hundred dollar This is this is worth that you, somebody works for several hours for it. So we believe in it. If we don't, if we stop, if we see we are betrayed by those people who can print as much money as they want, right? This money is of no value anymore for normal people, right? Because there are others who just can steal everything we have because they can print this money we believe in, right? It's a harvesting machine. And one of the reasons they're moving to total control is because they know that you're going to figure out you don't need them. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you look at the money machine, it's simply think of it as a a pump and dump machinery. And their goal is control of real assets, people, land, livestock. You know, they're looking to control real assets and the and the, the games they play with money is simply to get ownership and control of those real assets and to manage those real assets. Now, once we understand that the only thing that's real, the real wealth comes from people, it comes from education, it comes from land, it comes from growing crops, it comes from livestock. Once we're clear that money is simply a tool and it has absolutely no value, you know, what, what is What has value is real assets and the wealth we can create with it. Yes, and yes. that's what's real. 
that's the day that we start to break away from the breakaways and we start to build our own systems. Now, yes. it is perfectly easy for us to create our own ways to transact. And I can give you lots of ideas about how to do that. But the number one most important thing we need to do if we're going to create our own currency, barter, and other transaction systems, crypto, any anything of those, is what is needed. And you're the perfect person to sort of understand this. What is needed is the capability in local groups and areas and between local groups and areas to create governance and culture which can protect those systems and those people from sabotage, from, from divide and conquer, and all the tricks that destroy organization. We don't have a financial problem on planet Earth. We have a governance problem. And the yes. only solution that can solve a governance problem is a governance solution. And so the question is, when can we come together and build organizations that can withstand the gaslighting and the financial pump and dumping of their machinery? Because that is where, to date, we have not yet figured out how to build the organization, the culture, and the governance that can then do all the transaction and currency systems we need. We don't, we don't need them. We don't need their currencies. We don't need their management. We don't need their, we don't need them. We can do it. We can only do it if we can grow up and govern ourselves without being willing to be tricked and controlled by them. There are, there are two other things we have to have in mind. They are media too, to communicate. Money is a medium to communicate. Right. But there is also science and knowledge that we know what happens. Right. And we are dependent on the media. And there is one other, a third thing. This is the, the use of power. Right. Who can use power? You know, Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. He was very powerful. He, had, he was able to buy some soldiers. With those soldiers, he went robbing some villages. And he gave his soldiers what they robbed. Right. And they became more and more, and they were robbing and robbing and robbing and going. He didn't have a shack. He didn't. He could not write anything. He he just shared what they, the, the, what they what they found and what they robbed. Right. So this was without this was without money. This was real assets. <laughs> they were right. They were exactly. They were negotiating with. Uh, they were right. getting power over a big part of the world. Right. But this, this is this is limited, and. Um, You, what they do now, they don't even give assets to people. But what the soldiers, they use power, they use violence. Right. Because they they think, they hope that the money they get for it, they may buy some house sometime from it or whatever. Right. They are, so, they just, they, right. So they call it the central banking warfare, or I call it the central banking warfare model. So the central banks print money and then the military and enforcement make sure people take the money. And a lot of that enforcement is increasingly covert or invisible. So a lot of the a lot of the most powerful weaponry is invisible. And that's part of what we're up to. I mean, think about it. Somebody's trying to kill us. And meantime, we're inviting surveillance and invasive technology controlled by those people into our homes and lives and giving smart kids smartphones to our kids, which is giving those people direct access to our kids' minds. Yeah. You so You think this, because this PSYOP is uh, the most powerful weapon now existing, we, they just are selling for cheap money or they're even give, making it a present somewhere where there is war, like in Ukraine. They're just giving away right. the weapons. They don't need it anymore because right. they can govern us. They can have this control grip with us, grid with us, without any steel weapon or explosives they do well, if, just you can, the, if you if you can control somebody's mind that's a much cheaper way yes. to wage warfare yes right. there's no explosion anymore well you know some of us are very difficult to control so they use physical <laughs> force too <laughs> <laughs> can, can I ask you yeah. that we had uh, we talked to Whitney Webb about this uh, bank of uh -huh. uh, commerce, uh, commerce and um, I forgot its name. Do you remember like that? BCCI. Was in, BCC. So that was, let, let me just give you one important piece of background. When I was in Washington, Harry Albright, uh, when when the U.S. portion 
first American of BCCI was seized by the Department of Justice. Um, the district of New the district attorney in New York appointed Harry Albright to be the chairman of the bank. He he'd been a very successful banker, and Harry brought me on the board. So I was part of the cleanup team on First American, and as a result, had to look at all the documentation. In the in the process of coming on the board, I had to read thousands and thousands of pages of the all the documentation on their structure and what had happened. And uh, it was remarkable because everything that was going on had to have been approved at the highest levels of the White House, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury. It was all a sanctioned operation. Wow. And was that is there a connection to the um, Bank of International Settlement? Um, you know, I don't know what the relationship was between BCCI and, and the BIS. I never looked into that, so I don't know what the relationship was. You know, it's very possible there was one, but I have no idea. Because it seems maybe, or just a question, could it be that the Bank of International Settlement somehow took over, like once that other bank closed down to some extent? So, or? so here's what I think. I think that that the the growth of the black budget was making it very, very difficult to keep the overt side of the house from understanding what was going on. It, it, it became very hard to manage all the money laundering through private means. And I think a series of actions were taken to move more of the hidden system of the, and finance and black budget on budget in the United States. That's part of what the Patriot Act was about and 9-11 was about, engineering what you needed to do to bring a lot more of the covert side on budget and make it, you know, clearly through governmental pipelines. And I think doing what they did at the BIS was part of that. So they, you know, BCCI was such a mess and such a problem cleaning up that what they did through the BIS and the Fed going in is my guess is what they did was they created a much more sophisticated, much bigger pipeline because there's no way, I mean, when I looked at all the money that was disappearing from HUD, that's trillions of dollars. You can't launder that through pizza restaurants. Do you know what I mean? And so, so always the big question for me was how in the world are they laundering and moving this much money secretly? Now, some of it was on the Middle East wars. Some of it was through things like Enron is my guess, but The BIS is the only thing that makes sense because you're talking about way too much money. You're talking, you know, I, I've told you the story, I think, of when the largest, the head of the president, of the largest pension fund in America said to me in fiscal, was in spring of 1997, he said, you don't understand, they've given up on the country. They're moving all the money out starting in the fall. Basically, that's what happened. The $21 trillion signifies a movement of money You know, so 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 you're issuing Treasury debt, you're getting money, and then the money disappears out of the back door. And it's interesting. Yeah, but yeah. in 2017, yeah. when Dr. Skidmore did the complete survey and found that the number of undocumentable adjustments was 21 trillion dollars, that was the exact amount at the time of the official Treasury debt outstanding. So you know, you issue debt, and then the money disappears. For all I know, Vivian, they've created an endowment which is big enough to run a global government on a private endowment, you know, parked at the BIS. All those who participated in this big business, BCI, uh, they there are several uh, several parties who are who put the money there, which was laundered. It's not one person. It's not. There are several shareholders who who have, who put the money there, which is hidden now. Right, but, but he, uh, they, I can imagine that they don't have all the same interests, that they're struggling against each other, who has the most influence. Or do you think they are unified? It's one block. No, I, I, I think, think there, I think there's constant cooperation and competition, cooperation, competition. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons they took so much of it into sort of governmental or central bank pipes is to stop the competition and keep the competition in check. Mm. But I think, 
you know, as you know, I think they're going to fail. And I think it's going to be the the more you centralize power, the more the competition gets out of hand and impossible to manage. Yes. Aren't they now just spreading their money now to India and to other countries, Brazil and other countries, or Ecuador, or so where they influence governments and they give them shares of their money just to, to, to widen their possibilities? So I think there was a decision made in the 94 when the Fed went into the BIS to rebalance the global economy. So rebalance the gold inventories, rebalance the GDP, and you're going from a model where you have the first world taking advantage of the third world to instead a model where you're globalizing and bringing the third world up, but basically reducing and wiping out the middle class in your own countries. So it, they changed the model in a very fundamental way. And if you want to understand what they did and how they did it, there is a marvelous video recording of Sir James Goldsmith in 1994 who came to the United States and tried to persuade Congress not to adopt the Uruguay Round of GATT and institute the World Trade Organization. And he gave an interview with Charlie Rose where he, he laid out why as an economic matter what we were doing was insane and it would only end in heartbreak. And he was dead on 100% right and he describes everything that's happening today. Oh, gee, please give us the link. It would be great. To... Yeah. It's Sir James Goldsmith. If you just go to Solari and put in Sir James Goldsmith, okay. you'll find it. But it's a perfect example. That interview and my online book, Dylan Reed and the Aristocracy of Stock Profits, will both document and explain to you that when this was done in the mid-90s, when the financial coup began, they knew exactly what was going to happen. Everything that's happening today you know, in terms of conceptually, they knew it would happen. They knew their only way to deal with the finances in the United States and Europe was to bring down life expectancy. So the U.S., as soon as the U.S. gave up on the budget deal in 1995, they started taking multiple actions designed to lower life expectancy. It was a budget imperative. You either get people to put more in the retirement savings. And if they refuse to do that and you can't achieve financial responsibility, your only way to balance the budget is to lower life expectancy. And they did it on cue. Literally the next month after the budget deal, they did two things. They started the predatory lending at HUD and they approved OxyContin at the FDA. And, and <laughs> the poor neighborhoods were suddenly the target of predatory lenders and pill mills all targeting the same communities and cleaning them out. It was very now, successful. The, now they have the tool, the WHO, to do all these jobs. And now they, you know, this, the WHO, I just said it before, the WHO has this non communicable diseases has, as a goal now, as the next goal. And <laughs> with, with, with dealing with those non communicable diseases, with, or with food and with heart pressure, with blood, drug, blood pressure and all such stuff, they will. They will make programs and they will tell the people what is normal and they will tell the people what to do to, to, to be healthy in the way WHO uh, understands it. So having this, having this leverage, having this WH, WHO tool, you, can, you may very easily reach this goal right. and, and life expectancy is, is going down. So here's, here's the biggest danger to me of the WHO. So you've got, you know, biowarfare labs now engineered all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. And all you need is one or more. If you look at the money that's being pumped out in Washington and the United States, all the people who helped engineer the pandemic are getting big budget increases and big raises, you know, and the message is good work. And the people who don't want to play doing this are getting cleaned out. You know, they're building an infrastructure for the next big thing. But a lot of this is organized under biodefense. Mm -hmm. yes. So all they need is a is a bio warfare false flag. And then they can use the who and get off to the races because they're not protecting you. You know, they're, they're not trying to control you. They're not trying to destroy your sovereignty. They're trying to protect you from the boogeyman. So, you know, Santa Claus is going to attack us with a bioweapon. And, and, and then the who kicks in because they're just trying to coordinate 
protection against Santa Claus, right? Yes. Right. Very important, yes. Right. So if you look at all the money, if you look at all the money in pandemic preparedness, because, you know, we're all worried about the WHO amendments, but if you look at what they did in the National Defense Authorization Act, there's massive money going into pandemic preparedness. But I think it's it's they're going to play the biodefense game because that's how they avoid all the questions on another pandemic. One of the amendments is that WHO can decide, can have the hand on, on the national money even, can can go to the national money and say, we need this, we take it from you because we need it. WHO will be allowed to do that. And if one state doesn't do it, other states would be allowed to, to use force. This is all, it's all in those amendments. Right. And so, other states just say the NATO or whatever, who will come and, and take the money, you know, or do, or do right. it. Yeah. Right. So this is, there are a couple of issues this is going to come down to. One is taxation without representation. And right now, interestingly enough, in the United States, if you look at the powers under the Constitution, the citizens still technically have the ability to say, you know, uh, we're going to escrow our tax dollars because you're not obeying the financial management laws and you're spending the money illegally and money's disappearing. Um, but interestingly enough, the states under the Constitution, the the states you know, essentially bequeathed upon the government certain powers in the Constitution, but all the other powers are reserved for, to the states. The federal government cannot give away a power that is reserved to the states. And so I think one of the places where there's going to be a real legal, a very interesting legal war is the federal government can't give away the state's powers and the states have the right and the ability to take it back. Yeah. You know, the Wyoming tried to pass a law. Somebody put in a law in Wyoming that said that the CDC and the WHO will have no jurisdiction within the borders of Wyoming. You know, expect to see a lot more of those kinds of laws. Yeah, the federal structure may just dissolve then if, if something like that happens. Well, here's the interesting thing. The, Wyoming has the Constitution. The feds have the satellites. And the question is, which is going to win? So we have a question from the audience. What can every normal citizen do to actively go against uh, this um, this agenda um, and so to stop and or slow down this uh, the process of this hostile takeover? So there, there are many, many things you can do. But what I would suggest you do, the first thing you can do is use cash. Dial yes. back the digital systems. In a perfect financial system, we would have a balance of digital and analog. You know, you would want both. Both is healthy. They're trying to go to 100% digital. They need 100% digital to lock down control. So you want to dial back the digital, not because digital is bad. It doesn't have to be bad, but because we don't want them to have 100% digital control. So take everything analog that you possibly can. You know, leave your smartphone in the car. You know, use cash and get talking to the local businesses and enterprises about using cash You know, let's make cash fashionable and sexy again. So we we absolutely want to promote cash. If you go to Solari, I have an article called, I want to stop CBDCs, what can I do? You can pick it up on a search. It's real easy. And it's got a list of like 15 items of things you can do. Right. The, the first thing you should do is look at that and just do the one that moves you. You know, do the one that's energ energizing for you. Do the one that works for you. There's a ton of things you can do. One of the things you can do, going back to what Wolfgang and I were talking about with real assets, is make sure you have plenty of local fresh food. You support your local farmers, you know, whether it's food, water, energy, shelter. There was a German village a while ago that, you know, built their own energy system and was selling energy into the grid. So whether it's food, water, shelter, energy, make sure you have plenty of provision locally on a decentralized basis so these guys can't corner you. Because I'm telling you, we don't need their money. We need food, clothing, shelter, energy. So anyway, take a look at that article. There's a ton of things to do and never believe it's hopeless. It's not hopeless at all. If you look at how few people there are who are running and engineering the system, they can't control all the real assets unless we help them. And right now we're the one who's building the control grid. We have the power to just stop. 
That's the funny thing about this. It's it's I, remarkable how much wealth, explosive wealth, can be created if we just reverse the central control. I think you just gave a price to someone in southern Germany who made the who well, the village <laughs> made its own slaughterhouse. Wasn't oh, it, that wasn't there the, I thought that was Austria. No, it was Austria. Oh, maybe. A, oh, oh, I I don't want to say so. Somewhere <laughs> close to the Alps. Yes. Yes, it was in the Alps. It was Tyrol. <laughs> But they were oh, yeah. Austrian. I yeah, believe, maybe so. Austria. Yes. Yeah, I they were here it, of the week a couple of weeks ago. I find it great. Yes, <laughs> and such things. And yet there is there is an event now where where you have such uh, children health defense. They make a congress now soon, yeah. where farmers farmers are telling their experience and sharing their experience how to be independent, how to become independent right. from from those big gi giants and and right. Yes. Right, it's very, absolutely. it's very good. It's a good yeah. development. Yes, it is. And I it have is. A, another question from the audience: um, Is the connection between the um, the bank and maybe these asset managers or companies like BlackRock and and Vanguard and so on? Do you see some sort of co connection? If so, like who do you think is like uh, leading the uh, is is like in control basically? In, in case if we know they're. I don't think any of the people we're looking at are in control. Um, you know, if you're if you're Vanguard or BlackRock, you're basically, you know, managing a piece of the whole thing and you can't get separate from the whole thing. So, you know, if the central banks are pumping, you're going up, you know, you're you're playing with the pump. One of the challenges for the asset managers is we've ballooned The, the global financial system with a huge number of speculative assets. And now the debt is growing faster than the GDP, which means at some point the debt's going to be in real trouble. You know, in other words, think of the, think of the planet like a house and we have an asset and we have a mortgage and we have insurance and then we have equity. Okay. And if you keep growing the debt, so if the house is worth a thousand euro And your mortgage is, is 500 euro, but then we start growing the debt to the, you know, it's 5,000 euro and, <laughs> and 10, you know, up, up, up. And, and it becomes many multiples of the value of the house. Something's got to give. And so <laughs> you're trying to keep these speculative bubbles floating. You know, what, what, <laughs> this is why they're going to bribe all those governments, because they're, they have two sources of money. One, the private investors and the other sort of the tax players. And when you when you have the government and like Mrs. Van der Leyen, who has all the tax money of Europe, just spending it for some some so-called vaccines, uh, this is not a private this is not a private uh, investment, but right. this is this is a second source of of, of money. Well, it's a, blowing it's, up, it's, it's blowing it's up the bubble with tax money. Right. right, it's a rigged economy, and you're just trying to keep the rigging up. So. Um, I'm trying to give you an example. Let me tell you the problem that the leadership has and why they want to go to total control. So I'm going to tell you the story of a little town in Louisiana. Um, there was a little town in Louisiana, and the city council was trying to be persuaded to do another big Fed infrastructure grant. And there was a city councilman who felt, you know, we've done a lot of these Fed grants, and now we've got a whole lot of stuff we have to take care of, and it's not economic, so we don't want to do this. But the guys who were going to make big fees on the on the infrastructure project were pushing for it. So we hired a wonderful municipal engineer called Chuck Marone to come in and look at their infrastructure and and their economy and their municipal budget and see whether or not this made sense. So Chuck came in and he looked at how much infrastructure they built with all these federal grants. And he said, if you are going to just maintain your current infrastructure properly according to engineer standards you will have to raise your property taxes from an average of fifteen hundred dollars per property owner to eight thousand mm -hmm. now that's because they've built a federal obligation way beyond the private economy's ability to handle it and and because we've now created this huge bubble that as far bigger and more expensive than the private economy can handle, one of the reasons being that this bubble is doing things with organized crime to destroy the productivity of the fundamental economy, 
you know, the day of reckoning is upon us. And that's what the reset is. The going direct reset is the is 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 facing the fact that you've you've printed all of this money and bubbled the economy and the fundamental productivity is not there and you've got to you've got to bring in certain changes to fundamentally change that productivity whether it's reduce the population or bring in breakthrough energy or there're many different ways you can approach it but you can't keep going the way you're going the debt growth model is over and you need to reset and change if the german government goes on to spend the money they don't have like that There are all those soldiers, policemen and clerks. When they get old, they want their pension. And they they have become policemen and they have become clerks because they are calculating they will get their a good life when they are old. They won't get. There is no money. Like in well, Greece, we we experienced it. We, they, we experienced it in Greece. It was the same okay. here. But here here's the thing. If I illegally take the assets out of your pension and move them underground into the black budget, they still exist. They're there. And legally, I have a right to them. And in, they replace them in my pension fund with all sorts of funny money from the sovereign government that is now imploding. You know, you can think there's no money. But in fact, I would say, you know, they have a right to those assets which still exist. So I would say, one, there are assets, there is money. But the other thing I would say is if we decided to run the economy so it could be productive, we could create a lot more wealth. So if you allow organized crime, you know, if you allow children to run the country, you're going to get kindergarten. But if you allowed adults to run the country, if you had good governance, you know, there's a great deal that could be done. The problem is you need a meritocracy. And all of the people in leadership positions, I assure you, the moment we decide to have a good governance system, all the neocons are going to not only lose their jobs, but they're going to end up in prison, right? So you can see why they're not going to vote for for that. We we were in Germany. We were always speaking about Generationenvertrag. You know, the, this is contracts between generations, children, uh -huh. adults, and old people, and right. we all have to care for each other. We are right. responsible that children can live well, that the adults don't have to work too much for that, and that right. the old people still can live well. And this was a, such a this this always gave the, the guidelines for for good politics. This mm -hmm. is the idea the ideal we were we educated which what should be, but they just uh, have forgotten. I think mm, we haven't all forgotten. So, but we can basically only stop this this kind of activity once we have um, regained power, because otherwise it's just going to continue. I mean, like, I mean, you so know, like the beauty. It doesn't. As a theoretical matter, all we need to do is walk away and build elsewhere. If you look at who's building the control grid, we are all getting up in the morning, going to work, and engineering the control grid. The day the people who are going to be the losers in this system say, you know something, I'm not going to build your control grid. I'm going to walk out and go to work on building real assets in my community or whatever. I mean, we're we're building this. They can't do it without us. We're building right. our own digital concentration camps. All we need to do is stop. And it doesn't take everybody. If, you know, if a small percentage just start walking away and make it fashionable to walk away, make it fun to walk away, make it interesting to walk away, you know, signal the message. It's not hopeless at all because we are many and they are a few. Then, you know, I, I will tell you, I believe they're going to fail. And I think the reason we have to walk away and start building is I want something to be there when they do fail. Catherine, it's so important what you do. And you give so good examples. And I am very sad that they, they are not published in German more. <laughs> We, we, we need. <laughs> you know something? My online book is in German. Hmm. If you go to Dylan Reed and Co., I'll send you the link. But the Dylan Reed book is in German, and it explains okay. a lot of this. So, yeah, you should have prepared one ex one 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 book to show now. <laughs> one book to show. <laughs> well, you know, I tried to can, publish can... it in a hard copy, but I got threatened, and then the last time I. 
tried to publish it in hard copy, they threatened somebody in my family, so I backed off. Viviana, we 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 think over how we can publish, how we can 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 help to that it be published in Germany. Yeah, I think that's a good that's a very good idea. Okay, well, it's I'll send it to you. It's just do it, you know. Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, this this whole overview. I mean, it's a little bit frightening, but then I think it's also good to look at the details so you you get a better understanding of what's going on in the world because you are you know if you don't understand the the enemy, let's say, then it's very hard to to take the the right measures against these kind of right. the control grid, as you said. Right. So I believe that uh, I used to have a pastor who'd say, "If we can face it, God can fix it." You know, we're each one person. We can only do what we can do. The funny thing is if we all just do what we can do, the possibilities are immense of what can happen in a positive direction. The thing that has stopped us, you know, I said the inability to organize, that's one of the things we have to figure out. But the biggest thing to stop us is we won't face what's really going on. And that You know, the facing it and and the sort of sense of overwhelming and the grief is the doorway we walk through to find real solutions. Yes. Yeah. I like that is if you can face it, God can God fix can it. Fix, right. It's way too big for me. It's up to the big guy. So but I will do my piece. So Yeah. Well I think the force is with us anyway. So uh, <laughs> We should, uh, yeah, like, it's, yeah, it's great. I think it's always so enlightening when you um, give us more information about these, I mean, to, to a lot of people, very dark or like uh, not easy to understand um, topics like this financial system and, and all the shenanigans going on there. But I think it's really important. And I think you bring it to light in a, in a very accessible way. I think, you know, it's, it's easy to follow what you, what you tell us. So I think it's good, helps understanding. So, and this is why I love what you guys do and what the, what you've done. It's, Because we have to integrate all these different areas. You know, we're all in our lanes. So Wolfgang's in health and you're in law and I'm in money. And, you know, we have to get enough of a common language and integrate and rock and roll together that we get a good map of what's going on. And that I think that's what the pandemic has helped us do. Yeah, it's not really it's in your face now. It's it's become so, so much clearer. And uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, fantastic, Catherine. Thanks so much for sharing okay, all this. Thank and you. We have to put all the links thank into the, the new archive that we have so people can really access it, everything, like, immediately. I think we, at some point, hopefully, we're going to be able to translate the archive also into English. But I think for now, okay. it's, it's um, yeah, we. I mean, there's a lot of people uh, to, who speak English anyway, so right. I think a lot of people are going to have a chance to look at that in detail. Okay, thanks. Well, I'll thanks so I'll much. I'll send these links and have a wonderful day. And don't forget, next week we're celebrating the fact that Wolfgang is a hero. <laughs> That's great. I think he's a hero. I agree. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>